I do invite you this morning to open your Bibles to the book of Exodus today. We're in Exodus chapter 25, and today we will be moving from Exodus 25 to the end of Exodus chapter 31. I hope you have read ahead this week. Uh, this is a, an interesting text to deal with today, but all Scripture is profitable, and we look forward to learning from this portion of God's Word. By the way, just as a little preparation, the sermon this morning is going to feel incomplete. It's going to feel like a sentence without a punctuation mark. And that's by design, because I want to give you the sentence here, but I want to punctuate it down there. So we're going to look into this portion of God's Word And it's going to feel just a little bit incomplete, but just hang on. When we get to the Lord's Supper, we'll bring it all together and see its importance. So that's the the, the goal this morning. So once you've located Exodus chapter 25, I'll ask that you just briefly pause with me as we pray and ask the Lord to bless our time in His Word. Our Father, we thank You for the text that sits before us, part of Your inspired and holy Word. And Father, we will go this morning in these next few moments looking at tabernacles and furniture and incense and oils and rituals and priests. And Father, we desire, even as the author of Hebrews did the same, and yet he referred to what he did as an exhortation. And so we desire to be encouraged not just taught, but Father, that our hearts and our affections might be drawn to You because of Your Word. We thank You, Lord, for this time in the Word and following the time around Your table for Your glory. In Jesus' name, Amen. Every mountain is made up of tiny clumps Of dirt. And every ocean is just a collection of individual drops of water. Now, we prefer to think of oceans and mountains in terms of the whole rather than in terms of those parts, because that's an awful lot of parts to try to keep up with to try and locate and identify every drop of water that makes up the ocean or every clump of dirt that makes up a mountain would be simply too much to do. And life would be overwhelming and confusing if all we saw were the parts and not the, the whole. For instance, it sounds a lot... It, fa- it sounds like a much better deal if you tell the neighborhood kid, hey, I'll give you 20 bucks to mow my lawn. It sounds very different if you say, I'll give you 20 bucks to mow the 893 million blades of grass in my yard. That's, that's a lot to take in. And so we prefer to think in terms, in terms of the big picture at times and not to get lost in all the little details. I bring that up this morning because our text today, Exodus 25 through 31 is a passage that, that's how many people approach it. This section is one of the most detailed and tedious parts, not just of Exodus, but really of the entire Bible. There are numerous details and instructions and individual parts to keep up with. Measurements and weights and colors, and medals, and clasps, and rings, and poles, and all of this. And as you read this section, if you're not careful, just a a tidal wave of information sweeps over you, and you try to keep it all straight, and you start thinking to yourself, okay, wait, 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 how how long is a cubit again, and what what color is onyx, and and what is an ephod, and, and, and where in the middle of the desert did they get all this porpoise skin? I mean, like, all these questions come to mind. And it's a lot to to keep straight. 
There, there is a time and a place, I think, to, to look at every detail, every cubit and every pole and every ring and, and every sort of detail. But this morning what I want us to do is, is, is to take a step back and instead of looking at the individual clumps of dirt, I want us to step back and to look at the giant mountain jutting out of these chapters. All of these individual details and pieces of furniture, yes, they're all small and minute, and yet they all fit together, and they're this giant message that God was sending to Israel and even to us. We said that the book of Exodus is about God providing for His people And He's provided in many small ways and He's going to provide a blueprint for for the sanctuary, for the tabernacle. But what I want you to see is that with all of this, God made one huge provision. There's a giant gift that God gives that holds together all of these little details. You say, what is that provision? What is the mountain of this text? Well, God tells us what it is. If you look in Exodus chapter 25, go down to verse 8. God says, Let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. Wow! That's the huge mountain in this section. We easily get lost in the details, and and certainly the details were and are important, but, but God was sending them a message, I am going to take up residence among you. A holy God is going to live among sinful people. Now, that might not sound like much to us, given where we are sort of in history, But but I want to show you just how this was a history-changing move on God's part. God is about to do something here that has not happened on planet Earth since Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis 3, men walked with God, talked with God, spent time with God. They could be in the presence of God. And yet mankind, because of our sin, we forfeited that right and we were were sent out of the garden. And what happens? Now God is the one who takes the initiative to say, no, no, I want you to be in my presence. I'm going to make a way for you to dwell together with me. Think about it. In the Garden of Eden, God designed and created this beautiful place where men had access to God. What happens in this section here? God's about to design and create a beautiful place where men and women have access to Him. And the paradise that was lost is going to sort of slowly be regained and pieced together as God is revealing His plan of redemption. He says, I will dwell among them. Now my friends, let's be honest. Whether we realize it or not, that is the deep yearning of every one of our hearts. We long for companionship. We long for for marriage and friendships and to get along with others, but supremely we long to be in, in, in a relationship with God. He has designed us this way. And so every one of us should should know whether or not we we have access to this God. And in this passage, he's going to explain to Israel how they had this access. So we're going to look at some of the poles and the furniture and some of these, but I I want you to always keep in mind what this section is about. It's about the presence of God among His people. So at the risk of maybe oversimplifying this, I want us just to, to, to step back and see some of the big, sort of timeless details about this access that Israel had. 
Now, I'm going to bring up something throughout the message. I want you to hold on to this. The access that God's going to give them, okay, it was real access. It was genuine access. What I want to show you throughout is that it was limited access. There are lots of rules and lots of regulations and lots of specifics that govern the way they could come into the presence of God. And through this, God was preparing them and us for something more. So let's see the details of this passage. The first timeless detail we see here about man's access to God is that in chapters 25 through 27, God provides access to His presence and His provisions. We first see that God provides access to His presence and to His provisions. Now, these chapters before us, they deal with the tabernacle, and we're going to get to that later, and the furniture, or at least most of it. He's going to tell them how to build this and how to, to put it together, but before they can do all of that, notice what he says in verse 2, tell the sons of Israel to raise a contribution for me. They had to be able to build and to construct all of this. They need the building materials. You can't just go to Home Depot for lumber or to Joann's for fabric. They're in the middle of the desert. So where are they going to get it from? God says, get it from the people. Tell them to bring it. Tell them to give it. Tell them, and he goes through a list in verses 2 through 7 of gold and silver and bronze and fabric and clothing and, and all of these kind of animal skins and goat hair. He says, get it from among the people. Now, you say, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. I thought in Egypt they were slaves. Where do slaves come up with all this gold and silver and sort of royal decor and fabric? Well, if you remember, right before they came out of Egypt, God told them, I want you to go door to door and go trick-or-treating among the Egyptians. And you're going to ask them for their stuff, for their gold, their silver, their fabrics. And they came out with their arms loaded down and their camels heavy. And they came out into the desert. And now God is saying, remember all that stuff I, I let you get? I want you to give it back. I want you to bring it to, to construct this sanctuary. God providentially made sure they had everything they needed to do this. By the way, my friends, whatever God commands of His people, God also provides for His people. So He tells them here, you need to build this to bring the materials together. The first piece of furniture here is the, the Ark of the Covenant in verses 10 through 22. Now I'll confess, everything I know about the Ark of the Covenant comes from Sunday school or Indiana Jones. Probably not the, the best source. But they were to build this, this Ark. Now, if you ever looked at it, it's a surprisingly small box. It's not huge. It was relatively small, made of wood. It had a lid. There were rings on each corner and poles would slide through. It was overlaid with gold. The lid would come off and inside were the copy of the Ten Commandments and Aaron's rod and some manna. And, and on top of the lid there were these two angels and their wings sort of stretched out. And God says where the angel, where those wings meet and on that lid, He says that's a special place. And He calls it the mercy seat. In other words, this was not just a box. This is, this is kind of like God's throne in the sanctuary. This is where God's going to sit. This is where the people are going to come to Him. In fact, if you look at verse 22, God says, There, at the mercy seat, I will, there it is again, meet with you. He, at the end of that verse, says, And from that place I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. Israel. So he says to them, I'm, I'm going to do all of this to meet with you. And the point of the Ark of the Covenant is what? So that I can meet with you. So that you can come and have access into my presence. He next tells them to build a table. A table for bread. And most of the instructions here are how to form the legs and the top of the table and what kind of dishes and plates to have. And as important as, as all of that was, what was most important about this table was what went on the plates, and on the table. In verse 30 it says, You shall set the bread of the presence on the table before me at all times. 
Those of you who are reading the King James, this is where we get the word showbread from. The bread of the presence. When I was a kid, I heard showbread, and I thought, is that like monkey bread or banana bread? Like, what is showbread? I understand why they translate that way, because it literally is face bread, is, is, is what the Hebrew says. It's, it's bread that, that, that shows something. And what does it show? It shows the presence of God. Day by day, He gave them remember, manna, their daily bread. And he likewise is reminding them that bread is to come out every day and it's a reminder of my presence, my provisions, that you have access to me and all that I have. They were also to build a lampstand, a giant golden menorah with candles on it. And they were to light it. We learn elsewhere at the end of this chapter, 27, that the candles were to stay lit continually. And the priests were not to let them go out. They were to constantly trim them and keep them burning. Now, think, think about that for a second. We, we, we live in a day and age with artificial lighting. This was the only source of light in the entire tabernacle. And God was reminding them through this, this golden lampstand of, of Himself. Because you remember up to this point, how were they led? It was a cloud by day and what? Fire at night. So He says, put a little bit of fire on this beautiful menorah. And there you will be reminded that I am your light and you, Israel, are to be a light unto the nations. And in all of this, you are reminded of my presence. In chapters 26 and 27, we see the actual blueprints for the tabernacle. My kids asked me this week, they said, Daddy, what's a, what is a tabernacle? And I said, it's a, it's a giant tent. That's what it was. It was a basic sort of sort of structured tent with poles and sort of curtains and fabric hanging down. It was extremely colorful, extremely beautiful, and well designed. It explains in this that there was an outer wall uh, of, of curtains that hung down. Then there was a courtyard, and some of this furniture sat there. And then inside, there was the tabernacle itself. And in that tabernacle, there was all of this, this colorful, beautiful sort of curtains and imagery and walls that hung. God told them they were to also build a bronze altar. The bronze altar, when we think of that, it sounds very, you know, uh, otherworldly, and, and I guess it certainly was, but it was, a, it was a giant Weber grill is what it was. They killed animals and cooked animals on it. That's what the priests did. But they did this and, and, and there was that smell sort of going up constantly from the tabernacle as a reminder of sacrifices constantly being made in that place. Inside of the tabernacle was the holy place and then beyond that there was the holy of holies. And this room was the inner room and you know what sat there? The Ark of the Covenant. That's the presence of God. That's where God. That's God's throne room. That's where He sat. Now, we, we, as we saw earlier in the reading from Hebrews, the priests could go in to the Holy of Holies, but how many days a year? Just one. Now, one's better than zero, right? But my point is, they had access, but it was limited access. You had to wear certain clothes. You had to be from a certain tribe. You had to go through certain rituals and, and cleansings. There were all of these limitations, but yet God was saying, you, you have genuine, real access to my presence and to all that I have and to my provisions. You, you put all this together. Imagine if you were sort of an ancient, you know, vagabond Bedouin just walking through the desert and you didn't know who Israel was. And you come across sort of the crest of a hill and, you know, across the sand there and you look down and you see just... A mass of humanity, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people spread out all over the place and livestock and all this. And right in the middle, very obviously, there was this tent with all of this sort of royal decorations and these beautiful colors and the gold and the silver and the smoke going up and all of this. If you saw that for the first time, your response would have been something like this. Wow! Wow! I wonder what king lives there. There's apparently a very powerful, rich man who lives among those people. They ha apparently have a very royal leader in their midst. Because all the camps were arranged and all the furniture was arranged to draw attention to this certain 
place. And God was providing Israel access to his presence and to his provisions. I saw this week, Tim Keller made this comment. The only person who wakes up a king at 3 a.m. for a glass of water is his own child. And he went on to say, we have that kind of access. God told Israel, listen, you have something nobody else does. The throne, the place, the seat, this is the place where I will be and you have access to me. And if you need, you come and you ask. You can come into my presence and I will provide you with with what you need because I am here to dwell among you. God is no longer just a distant being off into the stars and the darkness. He's no longer a scary God there on the mountain just with, with earthquakes and lightning that only meets with Moses. Now God is among the people. And He's given them this access. There's a second detail we see here. Not only do we see what they had access to, but we also see that God provides them access through a mediator and a sacrifice. He tells them initially, you have access to me, but if you're going to come to me, you must come a certain way. You must come through a mediator and with a sacrifice. And chapters 28 and 29 deal here with the issue of the human priests and the animal sacrifices. He begins by talking about the priests. He says in verse 1 then of chapter 28, Then bring near to yourself Aaron your brother and his sons with him, for among the sons of Israel to minister as priest to me. God's going to go on to explain who can serve as a priest and sort of what branch of the family tree you had to come off of. You couldn't, you know, sort of in career day in kindergarten say, I want to be a priest. And they'd say, well, what tribe are you from? Benjamin. Sorry, you're out, you know. You had to come from a certain line and be part of a certain group. And so he says here, this is Aaron and his sons, and through them they're going to have this privilege. He goes on great detail about their uniform. The priest had a dress coat. They had to wear a certain apron and a certain robe and a certain headdress and it was, and it was the most magnificent thing you ever seen. It was, it was completely blinged out. I don't know if people say that or not, but it, it was. There was jewelry, like encrusted diamonds and jewels on this breastplate that they would wear. And on each one of those jewels, 12 stones were the 12 names of the tribes of Israel. Why is that? That's not coincidental. It's because the priests were the ones representing Israel to God. They were the go-betweens. They were the mediators. And they were responsible of carrying the weight of this responsibility to go to God on behalf of the people. And if you've ever noticed here, the clothing, the, the sort of uniform that they wore, the colors of the priestly garments are, are very much like the colors in the tabernacle. The, the priests were almost like little walking, talking tabernacles. That, that they themselves were to be associated even by sight with that special place. The tabernacle reminded people of God. The priest reminded people of the tabernacle. Ergo, the priest reminded people of God. There's a connection between this beautiful design that reminds people of them coming, how they come to God. It's not on their own. They come through a priest. The priests were certain people, they wore certain clothes, they performed certain rituals, and all of this was a privilege. Nobody just waltzed into the presence of God on their own. If you needed forgiveness, you came to the priest, and you brought your animal, and you trusted the priest to do his job properly, and to offer that on your behalf to God. If you wanted to give thanks for something, you brought your offering and you gave it and entrusted it to the priest that he did it properly on your behalf. God says, this is the way you come through a mediator. He also tells them they needed sacrifices, animal sacrifices. I've said before, Old Testament priests were less like pastors and more like butchers. They spent their days standing ankle deep in warm animal blood. 
They were constantly slitting throats and smearing blood and wiping it on their aprons. They were constantly, there was a flow of animals coming through that would be killed. Like it or not, Judaism was a very bloody religion. Because as Hebrews tells us, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So, so what God gave them, He says, you can have access to me. Here's how you come, though. You have to have a mediator, and you have to have a sacrifice. And, and by the way, one of the things we learned in this, it was a real access that they had, but even this, the priest and the sacrifices were limited. Because even though the priests, notice, they offered sacrifices for the sins of the people, but they also had to offer sacrifices for their own sins. And there was no one single animal who could satisfy all of the sins of the people, so guess what? It was limited in that they constantly had to do it. Day after day after day, sacrifices needed to be made. And so we see here that, 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 yes, it was real access, but it was limited. Limited in many ways. What's the point of all this? Look at the end of chapter 29. Twenty-nine, verse 42, he's done talking about the sacrifices and the priests. Twenty-nine, forty-two. it says... It shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the doorway of the tent of meeting before the Lord where I meet with you. Verse 43, I will meet there with the sons of Israel. Go down to verse 45, I will dwell among the sons of Israel. And again at the end of verse 46, that I might dwell among them. He says the whole point of this is don't get lost in the, in the, in the rituals, don't get lost in the garments. Understand the point of all this, that you can now come to me and you have access. Some of you read the insert this morning, I hope, where I shared about our recent news about our adoption, sort of the roadblock we've run into. As we were getting the news Wednesday for the first time, we were sitting there with the speakerphone on and the agent, our, our agency contact was explaining the details. And after she talked for a while, we finally, of course, we got to the point and I asked her, I said, here's my question, what do we pray for? It's a very complicated situation, so what do we pray for? And her answer to me was, she said, we need God to give us a person who is in the position and has the means to intervene on your behalf. He said, because right now you're not in a position and I'm not in a position and I don't have the means and you don't have the means to fix the situation. So we are relying upon God to give us an advocate, is what she said. My friends, that's what Israel needed. That's what every one of us needs to come into the presence of God. And he gave them both the person and a priest, and he gave them the means through the animal sacrifices. And he said, through these, you can now come into my presence. By the way, if these chapters teach us anything else, let me just add this. You either come to God on his terms or you don't come to him at all. N nobody sneaks into the presence of God. P people might be smuggled over borders from one country to the next. Nobody is smuggled into the kingdom. You come to the front door, and there's only one door. And he has made very clear who he is. And he says, you come through him and through the mediator and through the sacrifice, we have access. There's a third and final sort of detail that we see here, a reminder. He not only provides access to himself and through the mediator, Chapters 30 and 31, we see that God provides access which produces holiness and devotion. This access that he gives, it, it's to produce something, holiness and devotion in the people. These last two chapters, again, they're kind of a hodgepodge of, uh, there's another piece of furniture that needs to be built, and there's certain oils and incense, and then he talks about taking up a collection again and, and giving that money to the sanctuary. He talks about who's going to actually build this stuff, and then he ends by, by talking about the, the days they're going to observe. But, but in all of this, there's this recurring theme of holiness and devotion. 
He talks about the oils and the incense. And he repeatedly says, the oil is holy, Treat it as holy. And whoever it touches, they become holy. And understand that all of this is going to produce among you a people that are holy. He tells the people, he's reminding them that you are to be holy as I am holy. And he says each one of these is set apart for that purpose. In terms of their devotion, God tells the people in chapter 30, they're to take up again a, a contribution. If you look in chapter 30 at verse 14, he says, Everyone who is numbered through a census from 20 years and over shall give the contribution to the Lord. They were told to give regularly when a census was taken, kind of a tax or maybe a tithe we would think of, they would give it so that they could continue to show their devotion to the tabernacle, to the presence of God, and to each one participate in what was taking place. God also says there are certain men who, through their talents and their abilities, they've devoted themselves to build this. Chapter 31, in those first 11 verses, he says, there's certain men that I want you to to call on to build this. They have a special gift in this. Now, let let me just go back to something real quick, if if you'll follow. We said that in many ways, what's happening here is, is, is an echo of Genesis. Now notice, God created this this wonderful, beautiful place in the garden and men had access to Him. And, And what did God say at the very beginning there? That as that creation was happening, it says the Spirit of God was moving. Remember that? Here, God says, I'm going to create this beautifully designed place where I'm going to meet with you and look at chapter 31, verse Three, these men, I have filled him with the Spirit of God. So again, in the creative process of designing this special place, the Spirit of God is at work to create it and to build it. If you don't believe that this is in some ways an echo of the creation account, I'll show you one more. Remember how creation unfolded? Six times God said, Uh, Day one, day two, you go through all this, and then how did it end? With the Sabbath. Six times in these chapters, and the Lord said to Moses, and the Lord said to Moses, and the Lord said to Moses through six times, and then chapter 31, verse 12, how does it all end? The Sabbath. He says, don't forget that just like in creation, I made this place to commune with you, and once again, together we're going to build this place, and, and we're going to commune, and you are to have a special day set aside to rest and to worship and to remember. It says in chapter 31, verse 13, he tells the people, you shall surely observe my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between you and me that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. What does it mean to be sanctified? It means to be holy, to be set apart. He says there's going to be, again, there's going to be a special contribution and special oils and special incense and special craftsmen and a special day. And in all of this, I I am sanctifying, I am making you holy as yet you devote yourself to come into my presence and to worship me. And then how does it all end? Look at chapter 31, verse 18. It says, When he had finished speaking with him upon Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written by the finger of God. God took the initiative to bring sinful men into His presence. It was God's idea, and it was God's blueprint, and it was God's design that He laid out for them. And He says, you follow this, and when you follow this, I will dwell among you. In all of this, God was seeing to it that they had access to Him. But my friends, what God gave to Israel then, it was just a small appetizer. Again, it was all limited in so many ways. There were sort of restricted credentials as to who could go where and as to what could be offered. And yet, in all of this, 
God was preparing the world for the coming of Jesus. He was preparing the world so that we might have access to Him through His body and His blood. And so with this in mind, may we pray together. Our Father, we thank You for Your Word. And now for this time around Your table. We give thanks, Lord, for what You gave to Israel, access to You. And Father, we thank You for this Word picture, this very tangible, visible reminder of Your presence among them. And now, Lord, we come to our own tangible, visible, edible reminder of Your presence among us. Father, we pray that we would partake and celebrate and honor You. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask our leaders if they would join me here at the front as we prepare to distribute the elements this morning. If the message of our text was about access to God, how much more is the message of this table about access to God? The book of Hebrews tells us that old system with the tabernacle and the washings and the sacrifices, it was fading away and it became obsolete. In the scripture reading, it says they were waiting for a time of reformation. And the next verse says, but when Christ appeared, the time of reformation had fully come. God told Israel, you you, you need access to me and I'm going to grant it to you. And in the coming of Christ, he, He took all of those elements and all those pictures and they were all brought together in sending His Son. John 1 tells us that the Word became flesh and not just dwelt among us, literally He tabernacled among us. Scripture tells us in the book of Hebrews that His flesh was that veil which separated us from the Holy of Holies and His flesh was torn and ripped so that we might have access. We we are told in the book of Hebrews that, that, that Jesus comes not just as a priest and not just a high priest, but as a great high priest who comes not offering sacrifices for His own sins because He has none, but coming and offering Himself for our sins, doing what Aaron could never do. He didn't come into the presence of God to to atone for our sins just with a little bit of animal blood. He brought His own blood. It was a sacrifice that was given, as Hebrew says, once and for all. It was final. He didn't just come into the earthly tabernacle. Hebrew says He ascended into the heavenly tabernacle, into the presence of God Himself. And there He sits as our mediator, constantly interceding on our behalf. My friend, all of this, the furniture, the tabernacle, it was preparing Israel and pointing us towards the coming of Jesus. And this bread and this cup reminds us of what he's done. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, through Christ we have access in one spirit to the Father. We, can't, we don't have to just come one day a year into the presence of God, my friends. We can come boldly before his throne and there we will find help in our times of distress and need. My point in the message, Israel had access, but it was limited. In Christ, we have access that is unlimited through His body and His blood. And so may we partake together. Our Father, we thank You for the taste that is still upon our lips and in our mouths. 
that remind us of all that we have in Christ. Father, draw our hearts in faith to you and reassurance of your presence with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.